Okay, today is the uh, 10th of August, 2009, and we have come to the fourth book of the Sangita Nikaya, starting on the fourth book. This fourth book now uh, is named after the first chapter, Salayatana Sangita. So the book is called Salayatana Vaga, the book of the six sense bases. Uh, and this is another very important section concerning the six sense bases. And in this book, uh, there are ten sanguttas, uh, ten chapters. Uh, and the whole book is dominated by the first chapter, uh, Salayatana Sangyutta, which takes up half of the book. Uh, in the Pali text uh, of the Pali text society, uh, this uh, book four has 403 pages. And the first chapter uh, takes up 208 pages, about half of it. Now, uh, in this uh, first chapter they are going, that we are going into, uh, the Salayatana, Six Sense Spaces, uh, in this translation by Verbal Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, there are 248 suttas. Uh, I will read you some of the important notes uh, that Verbal Bhikkhu Bodhi has uh, written here. Uh, he says, uh, on first consideration, it would seem that the six internal and six extern- and external sense bases should be understood simply as the six sense faculties and their objects. With the term ayatana, base, having the sense of origin or source. Though many suttas lend support to this supposition, the Theravada exegetical tradition beginning already from the Abhidhamma period, understands the six pairs of bases as a complete scheme of classification capable of accommodating all the factors of existence mentioned in the Nikayas. So the Theravada commentarial tradition has uh, diverted a bit from the original suttas and the slightly different uh, Interpretation. The other note to read for you is it says uh, the main pragmatic concern with the six sense bases uh, is the eradication of clinging. For like the aggregates, the six the sense bases serve as the soil where clinging takes root and thrives, because clinging or attachment originates from ignorance and craving, and because ignorance sustains clinging by weaving its web of the triple delusion, permanence, happiness, and self. We find in the Salayatana Sangyutta almost all the familiar templates used in the Kanda Sangyutta. Often, in fact, these templates are here applied twice to generate parallel suttas for the internal and external sense bases. Thus, to dispel ignorance and generate true knowledge, we repeatedly hear the same melodies in a slightly different key, reminding us that the sense bases and their derivatives are impermanent suffering and non-self, that we must discern the gratification, danger and escape in regard to the sense bases, that we should abandon desire and lust for the sense bases. Several suttas in this chapter identify the six sense bases with the world, because the word loka is whatever disintegrates lojati, and because in the noble one's discipline, the world is understood as that in the world by which one is a perceiver and conceiver of the world. In one sutta, the question is raised why the world is said to be empty, sunya, and the answer given is because the six sense, because the six bases are empty of a self or of what belongs to self. No parallels to these discourses are found in the Kanda Sangyutta. This Sangyutta also describes the six internal sense bases as old karma, which could not be said so plainly about the aggregates, for they comprise both karmically active and resultant phases of experience. We further find here that greater stress is placed on conceiving, anjana, the distorted cognitions influenced by craving, conceit and views, with several discourses devoted to the methods of contemplation for uprooting all conceivings. 
entire Sangyutta ends with a masterly discourse in which the Buddha urges the monks to uproot conceivings in all its guises. The Kanda Sangyutta consistently treats the aggregates as the objective referent of identity view, Sakaya Ditti, the views that seek to give substance to the idea of a self. And the Putujana or whirling fashions a view about his or her identity. He or she always does so in, re- in relation to the five aggregates. We do not find any parallel text expressing identity view in terms of the sense basis. This difference in emphasis is understandable when we realize that the scheme of the aggregates spans a wider spectrum of categories than the sense bases themselves and therefore offers the worldling more variety to choose from when attempting to give substance to the notion of myself. This, it must be stressed, indicates a difference in emphasis, not a fundamental doctrinal difference. For the sense bases can be grasped upon with the notions, this is mine, this I am, this is myself, just as tenaciously as the aggregates can. Thus we even find a series of three suttas which state that contemplating the sense basis as impermanent suffering and non-self leads respectively to the abandoning of wrong view, identity view and view of of self. However, as a general rule, the sense basis are not taken up for a thematic exposition of identity view in the way the five aggregates are, which is certainly significant. We see too that the entire Ditti Sangyutta on the diversity of views bases all views to a misapprehension of the aggregates, not of the sense basis. In relation to the sense basis, the interest in views recedes into the background and a new theme takes center stage, the need to control and master the senses. It is the sense faculties that give us access to the agreeable and disagreeable phenomena of the world. And it is our spontaneous impulsive responses to these phenomena that sow the seeds of much suffering. Within the untrained mind, lust, hatred and delusion, the three roots of evil, are always lying latent. And with delusion obscuring the true nature of things, agreeable objects are bound to provoke lust and greed disagreeable objects, hatred and aversion. These spontaneous reactions flood the mind and bid for our consent. If we are not careful, we may rush ahead in pursuit of immediate gratification, oblivious to the fact that the fruit of sensual enjoyment is misery. To inculcate sense restraint, the Salayatana Sangyuta makes constant use of two formulas. One is the stock description of sense restraint, Indriya Sangwara, or sometimes it's called Indriya Gutta Dwara, uh, guarding the sense doors, usually embedded in the sequence on the gradual training, common in the Diga Nikaya and the Majima Nikaya. This formula enjoins the practice of sense restraint to keep the evil and wholesome states of covetous and displeasure from invading the mind. In the present chapter, it occurs at 35.120. 127, etc. The second formula posits a contrast between one who is intent upon a pleasing form and repelled by a displeasing form, and one who is not swayed by these pairs of opposites. The latter has set up mindfulness of the body, dwells with a measureless mind, and understands the liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom, where the evil states of lust and aversion cease without remainder. The doctrine of dependent origination reveals that craving is the propelling cause of suffering, and craving springs up with feeling as its proximate cause. Feeling occurs in the sixth sense basis as pleasant, painful, and neutral feeling, and through our unwholesome responses to these feelings, we nourish the craving that holds us in bondage. To gain full deliverance from suffering, craving must be contained and eradicated, and thus the restraint of the senses becomes an integral part of the discipline aimed at the removal of craving. Craving and other defilements arise and flourish because the mind seizes upon the signs, nimitta, and features, anu, bianjana, of sensory objects 
and uses them as raw material for creating imaginative constructs to which it clings as a basis for security. This process called mental proliferation, papancha, is effectively synonymous with conceiving manjana. These constructs created under the influence of the defilements serve in turn as springboards for still stronger and more tenacious defilements, thus sustaining a vicious cycle. To break this cycle, what is needed as a preliminary step is to restrain the senses, which involves stopping at the bare sensum without plastering it over with layers of meaning whose origins are purely subjective. This aspect of sense restraint receives special emphasis in the last two vagas of the Salayatana Sangyutta, which stand out by reason of their startling Im imagery and extended similes. Here the six sense faculties are spoken of as an ocean, the sense objects as their current, and the faring along the spiritual path as a voyage in which we are exposed to dangers that we can only surmount by sense restraint. Again, agreeable sense objects are like baited hooks cast out by Mara. One who swallows them comes under Mara's control. One who resists them escapes unharmed. It is better, we are told, to have our sense faculties lacerated by sharp instruments, hot and glowing, than to become infatuated with attractive sense objects, for such infatuation can lead to rebirth in the lower realms. Our existential condition is the depicted by the parable of a man pursued by four vipers, five murderous enemies, and an assassin. His only means to safety, a handmade bra. A monk in training should draw his senses inward as a tortoise draws its limbs into its shell. For Mara is like a hungry jackal trying to get a grip on him. The six senses are like six animals, each drawn to their natural habitat, which must be tied by the rope of sense restraint and bound to the strong pose of body-directed mindfulness. The Sangyukta ends with a parable about the magical bonds of the Asura king, Vipachiti, and sounds a decisive call to eliminate all modes of conceiving rooted in craving and wrong views. So these are interesting notes. Eh? The Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi has written. Now we start on the suttas themselves. Eh? We start with the first uh, Sutta 35.1 On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in Jaita's Grove, Anatta Pindipa's Park. There, the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, Venerable Sir, those monks replied. The Blessed One said this, Monks, the I is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering is non-self. What is non-self should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. The ear is similarly, the ear is impermanent, the nose, tongue, body, mind are impermanent. What is, what is impermanent is suffering, what is suffering is non-self. What is non-self should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Seeing thus monks. The learned, noble disciple experiences revulsion towards the eye, revulsion towards the ear, revulsion towards the nose, revulsion towards the tongue, revulsion towards the body, revulsion towards the mind. Experiencing revulsion, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge, it's liberated. He understands, destroyed his birth, the holy life has been lived had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. So this is one of the standard ways uh, in which the Buddha teaches the Dhamma that what is impermanent uh, uh, gives rise to suffering uh, and what is impermanent ever-changing uh, and a cause for suffering uh, uh, should not be taken as the self uh, and what is not self uh, should be seen with correct wisdom. This is not mine, this I am not, this not myself. And then seeing clearly, a uh, uh, learned disciple uh, experiences revulsion for what is impermanent. And then from revulsion, he becomes dispassionate and becomes liberated. Uh, the next sutta is 35.23. Asavati, 
That's uh, page 1140. Mounts, I will teach you the all. Listen to that. And what mounts is the all? The eye and forms, ear and sounds, nose and odors, tongue and taste, body and tactile objects or touch, mind and mental phenomena or thoughts. This is called the all. If anyone mounts should speak thus, having rejected this all, I shall make known another all. That would be a mere empty boast on his part. If he were questioned, he would not be able to reply. And further, he would meet with vexation. For what reason? Because monks, that would not be within his domain. That's the end of the sutta. So the Buddha says, uh, the all uh, is the eye and forms, ear and nose, tongue and odors. Sorry, nose and odors, tongue and taste, body and tactile objects, mind and mental phenomena. The six senses. The six senses uh, comprise the six sense organs. And then the objects, uh, the external objects uh, like forms, sounds, smells, taste, touch and thoughts. Uh. Now, with the consider each uh, sense base, uh, if you have the eye and the forms, uh, this is the condition uh, for the eye consciousness to arise. Uh. And then the meeting of the tree uh, is contact. Uh. Uh, is contact. So, when there is contact, uh, then feeling arises. Uh. And followed by perception, thinking, volition, etc. Now, because the eye and the forms give rise to eye consciousness, and similarly for the other sense bases, the ear gives rise to ear consciousness, and nose to nose consciousness, tongue to tongue consciousness, etc. So, uh, the whole world is within the consciousness. Without consciousness, there is no world. So because uh, the whole universe uh, is to be found in consciousness, uh, that's why uh, the Buddha says uh, that uh, these sense bases uh, is the all, all of the whole world uh, is to be found in the six sense bases. That's why there's one sutta where the Buddha says uh, uh, the world is within this body, uh, this body and this mind. The origin of the world is also within this body. The end of the world is also within this body, and the path going to the end of the world is also within this body. So we don't have to look far, we just have to go into our body and mind, and all the answers are there. The next sutta is 35.28, Aditya Pariyaya Sutta. It's one of the famous suttas, that's on page 1143. It's one of the very famous suttas because uh, in the early days uh, when the Buddha was gathering disciples, uh, he found 1,000 ascetics uh, who were staying by the banks of the river and they were external ascetics. Uh, so they prayed to fire, they worshipped the fire and they kept long hair. Uh, they were uh, matted hair ascetics uh, and uh, their name were Jatilas. Uh, they were called Jatilas. Uh. But um, I believe uh, with good reason uh, that uh, they all uh, practice jhana uh, and had attained jhana. Mm. That's why the Buddha went to them. The Buddha generally, uh, when he wants to gather disciples, uh, he will look for those uh, who have attained jhana. Because uh, those who have attained jhana are very easy to teach. Uh. Even the first person the Buddha wanted to teach uh, was his former teacher who taught him jhana. And it is uh, clear from the Vinaya books uh, why he selected his teacher first to teach uh, was because he thought uh, his teacher has attained jhana. It would be very easy for him to understand the Dhamma. Mm. So similarly, he came to this, the Buddha came to these 1,000 jatilas uh, at the banks of the river. And because uh, probably several of them uh, had psychic power already, uh, so it is not easy to convert, uh, especially the leader. The leader thought that he was an Arahan, probably because he had psychic power. So the Buddha stayed with them uh, for several weeks. Uh, and during those several weeks, uh, the Buddha showed uh, indirectly uh, uh, psychic power uh, to them, uh, to impress them. For example, uh, at night, uh, uh, the devas will come to meet to see the Buddha. Uh, so when the devas come to pay respect to the Buddha and talk to the Buddha, uh, the whole place is lighted up. Uh, so they know, and then the next day they'll ask the Buddha, how come, uh, who came to see you? The whole 
Kuti around there was bright, and the Buddha said, "Oh, Sakada, Sakadeva Raja came to see me." Uh, so they were very impressed. And then another night, uh, Buddha said, "Oh, Brahma came to see me." Uh, so they were very impressed. And then uh, other ways of showing psychic power. So much so uh, that they were totally impressed with him. Then, then only uh, the Buddha told off the leader and said, uh, "Kasapa, you keep thinking you are an arahan, but you are not an arahan." And you are not practicing the right way to become an arahan. So he got a shock because uh, all the time uh, everybody respect him. Uh. Here the Buddha is challenging him. So he started thinking, and uh, then he realized uh, the Buddha's cultivation is much higher than him. Uh. Then he shaved off his hair and became a disciple of the Buddha. And when the 999 other disciples saw, uh, they also shaved off their hair uh, and all became disciples of the Buddha. So after they became disciples of the Buddha, then only the Buddha decided to teach them the Dhamma, and the Buddha taught them this this sutta, Adita Pariyaya Sutta, and just teaching them one sutta, they just heard one sutta, all of them became arahants, which proves indirectly uh, that they, they all had attained the four jhanas, because the the condition uh, for attaining arahanthood uh, according to the Buddha is the four jhanas. Uh. So because they like to worship fire, the Buddha base is taught on fire. The moment the Buddha talked about fire, they all got very interested, all paid solid attention. Mm. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Gaya, and Gaya's head, together with a thousand monks, that's just after they had uh, ordained with the Buddha. Mm. There the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, all is burning, and what monks is the all that is burning? The eye is burning, forms are burning, eye consciousness is burning, eye contact is burning. And whatever feeling arises with eye contact as condition, whether pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant, that too is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of lust, with the fire of hatred, with the fire of delusion. Burning with birth, aging and death. With sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair, I say, stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is saying that the I, because we have the I, then we have the I consciousness and then there is contact and from contact feeling arises and from feeling you have craving. So all this, your passion, so all this is a cause for greed, hatred and delusion. And because of greed, hatred and delusion, you will have birth, aging and dying, and sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair, all kinds of suffering. Similarly, the Buddha said, the ear is burning, sounds are burning, ear consciousness is burning, ear contact is burning, and whatever feeling arises with ear contact as condition, that too is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of lust, hatred and delusion, burning with birth, aging and death. With sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair, I say. Similarly, uh, the nose is burning, uh, odors are burning, nose consciousness is burning, nose contact is burning, and whatever feeling arises with nose contact as condition, that too is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of lust, hatred, delusion, burning with age, birth, aging and death. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair. Similarly, the tongue is burning, uh, tastes are burning, tongue consciousness etc. is burning, body is burning, touch, tactile objects are burning, uh, body consciousness is burning, body contact is burning, whatever feeling arises is burning, and the mind is burning, uh, uh, the mind is burning, uh, thoughts are burning, uh, mind consciousness is burning, mind contact is burning, and whatever feeling arises, uh, that too is burning. Burning with the fire of lust, hatred and delusion, burning with birth, aging and death, with sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure and despair, I say. Seeing thus monk, the learned noble disciple experiences revulsion towards the eye, towards forms, towards eye consciousness, towards eye contact, towards whatever feeling arises with eye contact as condition. Similarly, uh, the learned noble disciple experiences revulsion towards the ear, towards sounds, towards ear consciousness, towards ear contact, etc. Uh, similarly, experiences 
uh, revulsion towards the nose, uh, towards odors, towards nose, consciousness, etc., uh, towards uh, tongue, uh, towards taste, towards uh, tongue consciousness, towards uh, body, towards uh, touch, towards uh, body consciousness, etc., and similarly towards uh, mind, towards um, thoughts, towards mind consciousness, etc. So experiencing revulsion, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands, destroyed his birth. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for the state of being. This is what the Blessed One said. Elated, those monks delighted in the Blessed One's statement. And while this discourse was being spoken, the minds of the thousand monks were liberated from the asavas by non-clinging. Mm. Which means all one thousand of them attain arahanthood. Mm. So you see, for a simple discourse like this, uh, for a person to attain arahanthood, uh, the mind must be so clear that uh, every sentence that the Buddha says, uh, they can absorb so clearly. The Buddha says uh, that uh, when we listen to the Dhamma, whether we can absorb or not uh, depends on the condition of our mind. Uh, if a person has attained the four jhanas, like these monks, uh, their mind is so clean uh, of defilements, uh, clean of the hindrances. Uh, uh, so uh, it's just like the Buddha says, I uh, give a simile, if you want to dye a piece of cloth, uh, if you have a white, clean piece of cloth, uh, you soak it in the dye, uh, when you take out, uh, it absorbs all the color. Yeah? Uh, just, just like the person, a clean mind uh, absorbs all the dhamma. Uh. But if you have a dirty piece of cloth, uh, uh, with colors already and it with oil, with stain, uh, dirty and all that. You go and soak it in the dye and you take out, nah, it cannot absorb. <laughs> cannot absorb any color. Uh, so that's, uh, for most people, uh, our mind uh, is dirty, uh, dirty with all the defilements, with all the hindrances and all that. So that's why the importance of attaining uh, focused mind, uh, having samadhi, uh, uh, mind that is uh, attain samadhi uh, is rid of all the defilements, uh, the hindrances. Uh. And the next sutta is 35.30. Monks, I will teach you the way that is appropriate for uprooting all conceivings. Listen to that and attend closely. I will speak. Uh, this conceivings, uh, uh, the word is manyana. It is the distortional thought process, uh, plus the notions that arise from it. Uh, for example, I am, I exist. Uh, uh, what will I be in the next birth? Uh, what was I before? Uh, who, who created me and all these things? Uh, mm. So this is all the, so this manana conceivings uh, is synonymous uh, with proliferation of thoughts. Uh, pro proliferation of thoughts uh, generally is known by another name, uh, papancha. Uh, but they are uh, connected, uh, similar. Uh. So the Buddha wants to teach uh, how to uproot the conceivings. Uh. And what monks, you know why, why we want to uproot the conceiving? Because once we have views, uh, we have views uh, only because we have the ego, uh, because of the ego of uh, the, the self, uh, then we have views. Uh, uh. And what monks is the way that is appropriate for uprooting all conceivings. Here monks, a monk does not conceive the I, does not conceive in the I, does not conceive from the I, does not conceive the I is mine. Similarly, he does not conceive forms, uh, I consciousness, I contact, and whatever feeling that arises with I contact as condition, uh, he does not conceive that, does not conceive in that, does not conceive from that. Let's not conceive that is mine. Let's talk here for a moment. Uh. This uh, Dhamma teaching here uh, is similar uh, to the first sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya. And the Majjhima Nikaya contains 152 suttas. Uh. So a lot of people, when they start reading the Majjhima Nikaya, they start with this first sutta. Uh. It's like being uh, punched so hard, uh, you get knocked out. Uh. Because uh, this sutta is so un hard to understand, you know. Most people who read it uh, can't, cannot make head or tail out of it. <laughs> so 
So they become very discouraged. Lah. Uh, that's why normally I tell people, you want to study the Majima Nikaya, you skip the first sutta. <laughs> Uh, you read all the other suttas and then towards the end only you come with the first you come to the first sutta. I don't know why they're gonna put this sutta right in the front uh, to kill people. <laughs> so this one this one for many years or so I couldn't understand <laughs> only recently only I come to understand. So here yeah, you see it's, uh, a monk does not conceive the eye. That means he does not think about the eye lah. there's no proliferation of views uh, about the eye and he does not conceive in the eye what does this mean uh? he does not conceive in the eye he does not conceive from the eye this is a difficult part he does not conceive in the eye uh, uh, to me uh, it means uh, he does not conceive uh, an object in the eye uh, and then he does not conceive from the eye means uh, he does not conceive uh, a subject uh, apart from the eye because once you start thinking about the eye, uh, whatever you start thinking about it, uh, then you think uh, it is an object. Uh, and then you are the subject uh, apart from that object. Uh, so there's a duality. Uh, uh, I and and uh, other. Uh, there is a self, there is others. Uh, uh. So he does not conceive an object in the eye. He does not conceive a subject. Uh, that means uh, myself. Uh, Apart from the eye, does not conceive the eye is mine. This eye is, is the physical eye, la, uh, matter. La, uh. Similarly, he does not conceive forms. He does not conceive in uh, object, la, an object in form. La. He does not conceive a subject apart from form. La. He does not conceive the form is mine. Uh. Similarly, he does not conceive eye consciousness. Does not conceive. An object in eye consciousness does not conceive a subject from eye consciousness. Does not conceive eye consciousness is mine. Uh, similarly for eye contact and feeling. Uh, and then for the other basis also the same. Uh, he does not conceive the ear. He does not conceive an object in the ear. He does not conceive a subject apart from the ear. He does not conceive the ear is mine, etc. Similarly, he does not conceive the nose, tongue, body, and mind, uh, and all the other things that come with it. Uh, he does, does not conceive that, does not conceive an object in that, does not conceive a subject apart from that, does not conceive that is mind. Uh, he does not conceive all, does not conceive in an object in all, does not conceive a subject uh, apart from all, does not conceive all is mine. Since he does not conceive anything thus, he does not cling to anything in the world. Not clinging, he is not agitated. Being unagitated, he personally attains Nibbana. He understands, destroyed his birth, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. This monks is the way that is appropriate for uprooting all conceivings. So the important point here is to see that there is no uh, differentiating of something out there and you here. That's why there's only one sutta where the Buddha was asked by an ascetic. If I remember correctly, this the monk was going on arms round in the butt. And then this ascetic, he actually, he had psychic power. So because he had psychic power, he thought he already finished his work, he already was an arahan. And then a deva came to tell him that he is not an arahan. Then he was surprised. And then the deva told him, but there is an arahan in the world, Samasambuddha. Then the deva told him where and where. So he seems, he traveled the whole night using um, his, uh, his uh, part psychic power, la. like uh, he could run so fast, la. run so fast, and I traveled to where the Buddha was, la. and when the when he arrived, la, it was morning, and the Buddha was on arms round, la. I think his name was Bahia Daruchari, la. so he asked the Buddha to teach him some Dhamma, the Buddha said, this is not the proper time, la. I'm on arms round, second time he asked the Buddha, again the, the, the Buddha said, this is not appropriate, la. 
Third time he asked the Buddha, he said, uh, I don't know how much time I have left. La. I don't know how much time you have left. La. So, uh, since uh, life is so uncertain, uh, I, uh, please teach me some Dhamma. La. I don't need you to teach me a lot of Dhamma, la. just concise Dhamma. Then the Buddha gave him very brief instructions. The Buddha said, uh, but here, always remember, in the seeing, uh, there is just the seeing. Uh. Sometimes they translate, uh, in the scene, there is just the scene. Uh. In the hearing, there is just the hearing. Uh, in the smelling, there is just the smelling. In the tasting, there is just the tasting. Uh, similarly, for the touch and thinking. Uh. What the Buddha is trying to say, uh, when this consciousness arises, uh, this just consciousness arising. Uh. Uh. But usually, when, for example, when we see something, uh, we think uh, we see an object out there. And I am doing the seeing, right? Uh, I am doing the seeing. So you have, an, uh, you have a self and you have others. Uh, similarly with hearing. Uh, and there's hearing, uh, you hear a sound, uh, you think uh, I hear the sound. Uh, and the sound is out there. Uh, so uh, this creates the self, this creates others. Uh. But the Buddha is trying to say, uh, when consciousness arises, uh, consciousness uh, makes up the whole world. And what you see, what you perceive as the self and others are all inside consciousness. There's nothing else. So in the seeing, there's just the seeing. In the hearing, there's just the hearing. Don't start conceiving. Don't start thinking. There is a self, there's others out there and all this thing. Everything is like a dream, just within our dream consciousness. So just giving these brief instructions, because this uh, Bahia, uh, his mind was so clear, uh, having attained the four jhanas, uh, he understood. Understood, uh, and uh, I think he attained uh, Arhanhut. Uh. Then he begged the, the Buddha to accept him as a disciple. Uh, and the Buddha accepted him and the, as a disciple. Uh, the Buddha asked him to go and look for rope, uh, rope and arms bowl, uh, to, to become a monk uh, in the Buddha's... Uh, uh, Teaching uh, Buddhist religion, uh, you got to have a proper robe and arms bowl. Uh. So he went to look for arms bowl, uh. and then when he was looking for arms bowl, uh, the cow uh, gored him to death. Uh. This happens uh, quite often uh, because cows, uh, if they have the baby with them, uh, the calf, uh, they see a monk, uh, they don't like this color. This is like a tiger color. So when any, any monk wearing this robe uh, goes near the calf, uh, he will attack. Uh. Uh, I also had the experience, uh, a few of us monks uh, going arms around the paddy field, uh, we didn't notice uh, that uh, the cow was tied there uh, with the calf nearby. Uh. So when we went near, uh, suddenly he got up and chased us. Uh, we were all scattered in all different directions. <laughs> mm, so this happens. Uh. So this sutta uh, uh, is quite... Uh, Deep sutta, not, not, not easy to understand uh, this type of sutta. If you read by yourself, uh, uh, in the first time you read, uh, you can't make head or tail of it. Uh.